Welcome to Channel 17, the Town of Colony Government Channel. Welcome to So Many Books, So Little Time. My name is Joe Nash. I'm here with Zena Shevchik. We are both librarians here at the County Library. The premise of our show for the 24th time, this is a show 24, Zena and I go down to the new bookshelf and to our technical services department where all the new books are being processed. And we're going to tell you about a lot of new books. And as usual, Zena will be going first. Zena. Thank you. Um, I like to pick out books on topics that I normally wouldn't read about uh, or I normally am not interested in personally. Uh, and so this is kind of a, this first book is a, a real departure for me. It's called Girl Hunting, Revolutionizing the Way We Eat One Hunt at a Time by Georgia Pellegrini. Now she's a chef and she apparently is a, cla she's a classically trained chef. She's also very young and pretty. The uh, photograph is of her in uh, uh, everyday clothes, kind of, in one hand with a rifle and the other hand a, a cast iron uh, frying pan. And she's blonde and very lovely. Um, so I suppose the, the cover attracted me. She uh, is also a, uh, she blogs, uh, a food blog, and I guess she's famous for that. So uh, the premise of the book was she wanted to see if she could eat uh, only the meat that she kills, or she could kill herself with, within a calendar year. And uh, I guess, I'm sure she blogged about this, but th uh, this is a book about uh, her experiences. And um, what she did was, well, she, her attempt was because she thinks that we're, uh, as Americans, uh, too removed from our food and uh, she uh, felt that it was hypocritical uh, of us not to, who eat and enjoy meat, not to actually experience hunting. And she actually, the book, she actually recommends it at, at least as a once in a lifetime experience to go out and uh, do hunt, at least uh, go with someone who's hunting. And she uh, hooks up with um, different uh, uh, hunters, all of whom are um, masters in their field in one way or another, well known. Um, and she goes uh, turkey hunting and, and elk hunting and it, actually she went, she went one kind of pig hunting. I'd never heard this kind of animal. It's called a javelini. And she went bird hunting, I guess grouse and pheasant. And uh, she talks about all of her experiences. I mean, there is some humor to it, but it's also um, uh, uh, very, um, she treats with great respect the uh, process of hunting. And uh, certainly the people, the master hunters she, she followed, and she actually did do hunt. She did hunt, and she describes her ex different experiences. Um, she also includes uh, recipes uh, for all the different animals that uh, you know that she uses uh, to to uh, make the recipes. Uh, no, I didn't say that correctly. She she includes recipes for um, all the different animals that she actually hunts and kills, and um, so that's uh, interesting as well. Um, she uh, each chapter begins with a quote, and one of them that cra really made me laugh was a quote from Theodore Roosevelt, who said that as long as there is lead in the air, there is hope. Um, and another one, no, I'm not a good shot, but I shoot often. Uh, so it's, it's very different from anything I've ever read. It's serious, um, but humorous as well. And uh, so I, I really recommend it. I found it very interesting. Nothing I ever in a million years would uh, do myself unless I was forced to. You know, the lights went out in the world and uh, we had to make our own way. But um, sh sh it's very interesting, the process 
process of hunting and how these master hunters approach um, the whole um, endeavor. So I, I really recommend it. I actually read it cover to cover. Girl Hunter, revolutionizing the way we eat one hunt at a time. All right, it's, it sounds a little like that Michael Pollan book. Remember yeah. he went out and he, he got all the materials for his meal, but it, I think it took him a year to, <laughs> to get everything. Right. I mean, hunting is, the oh, yeah. actual killing is what, you know, it's, well, it's just true, uh, yeah. the bridge. She actually thinks that makes us feel more human when um, we actually okay. hunt. So. Well, I'm going to start with two books on the same subject. One, uh, they're on college sports. The first book is called, now we have someone who works here from Poland, so I had to ask her how to pronounce this author's name. It's called The Last Great Game, Duke versus Kentucky, and the 2.1 Seconds that Changed Basketball by Gene Wojciechowski. It's about the famous Duke-Kentucky basketball game in 1992, an absolute epic basketball game. Um, I, I was skimming through this book for our show, and I thought, well, just, you know, I usually read the, read the flap, uh, read some reviews and be able to talk for a minute or two about it. But I actually brought it home over the weekend, and I almost finished it over the weekend. It's it's fantastic. It's really good. I'm not a big sports books reader, but I, I like certain sports books. But they're usually, to hold my attention, they got to really be good. This book is really good. That was an epic game. He goes behind the scenes to the coaches, Mike Krzyzewski, Rick Pitino, all the players. Um, Jamal Mashburn on Kentucky, Christian Leitner, Duke. You know, there was a, it was an epic, I keep saying epic, but it was a great game. And, you know, Duke has his persona as the, sort of the good guys. The year before, they beat UNLV, the bad guys. And Kentucky was an up-and-coming team. Kentucky just got off probation. And it was a great game and went down to the, it's the famous play you see in all the highlights when they throw the ball the full length. Christian Leitner turns and shoots. And it was, just, it was an overtime, too. It was a great game. So... And this, this is all behind the scenes. It's all about the programs, the people leading up to that game. Of course, you couldn't write a whole book about one game. So it's all the stuff leading up to it. And the last chapter is about what they're doing now. So 20 years later, this book is um, this is the 20th anniversary. So, yes, you have a question, I have Zina? a question. <laughs> what makes a team a good team? And, like, what makes the UN, I, I think that's University of Nevada, Las, yeah. Las Vegas, what makes them a bad team? Well, I, I, I don't mean like bad. Like evil. They're, no, they weren't bad, but... I think back then the persona was that UNLV was sort of cheaters. Okay. They had guys, a lot of guys on probation. I think they had guys that may have been. So they weren't quite playing fairly. And they, I, well, this perception. They were fair, the their perception. perception. I think um, UNLV had a lot of violations for recruiting. Of course, in all college sports, I don't know how. Are these guys truly... What year was it? This is 92. In all college... So it's all cleaned up in 20 well, years. Well, no. No, the other book... I'll, when I get into the other book, you'll say it's not. <laughs> but um, I think back then, you know, um, they were known as sort of... I don't know if they were known as... A lot of college students, are they really student athletes? That's a big question. I mean, I'm sure Duke, for all its squeaky clean image, no one's perfect in college sports, but this is a very, it's all about um, that game and the players and how hard they work. It's, it's sort of, it's really good. My next book on college sports could, I don't want to, it could be the opposite. It's called Three and Out. This is about college football. Rich Rodriguez and the Michigan Wolverines and the Michigan Wolverines in the crucible of college football. This is about the coach of Michigan and how after three years only, they gave him three years, he, he didn't win, and he was out. And this is a more, this is like the other books, a lot of behind the scenes stuff, but I think this book is a little more critical of the student athlete, the NCAA. These guys aren't really, these guys are pros. They, the college players, and particularly in football and basketball, the big money making sports, they really should be paid. I mean, I, I, it's, it's really minor league, minor league. And this book, I don't want to say this is positive and this is negative, but this book really gets behind the scene of the, pre the big time pressures in college sports, the donors, the, um, the, the alumni and everything. And so I haven't read the, that much about this book, but my take on it from the reviews is this is really behind the scenes. It's really not, quote, you know, they're not really student athletes, and it's not really college, you know, sports. It's really, it's really big time sports uh, under the guise of college. Um, the, the book about the Kentucky Duke game is more a celebration of a great game and basketball and all that. So they don't. I'm, I'm almost done with it, but it was really good. So both books, I think you could say two different takes on college sports. 
last great game, Duke versus Kentucky, Gene Wojciechowski, three and out, Rich Rodriguez, and the Michigan Wolverines. Lena? Okay. Uh, so I'm kind of shifting gears here. Uh, this is a more classical literary uh, discussion um, about a uh, uh, classic Moby Dick and uh, by a writer, Nathaniel Philbrick, who is a famous nonfiction yeah. writer. Oh, Mayflower. Uh, right, and um, historical, right, historical things. And um, this book is called Why Read Moby Dick? And um, it's a very short book, a small book, <clears throat> but it's full of, chock full of wonderful information. Now, let's see, it says it's 100 and, I don't know, 30 pages, but, it, it, you know, the short pages, lots of white space, but um, I have never read Moby Dick. It was um, too intimidating for me in its size, and I suspect it's a lot of people, and that's what his point is, that people who maybe have been reluctant to try to read it, um, this uh, just kind of holds a, uh, a carrot in front of your nose, um, and he tells, uh, Nathaniel Philbrook tells some really interesting things about the environment uh, in which um, uh, Melville, Herman Melville, the writer of Moby Dick, uh, w what his life was like, what the country was like at the time, the westward expansion, the slavery issues they were dealing with. It was kind of the 1851 was when Melville wrote it, and um, he's writing about that time period. Uh, the time of the Moby Dick is in the 1850s. Um, as well, um, so he he's presenting an historical uh, context, uh, Philbrick, but it's not written dryly at all. It's uh, the chapters are very short. He addresses one particular issue or trend per chapter. Um, I found it fascinating uh, to learn about um, the whaling industry uh, at that time. The um, actual event that uh, inspired Melville to write Moby Dick. Um, he talks about uh, how Nathaniel Hawthorne uh, really influenced Melville's reworking of the uh, novel Moby Dick. Um, it talks about all the different issues that are uh, um, dealt with and approached in, the, in Moby, Bo Moby Dick. So um, I really found it, again, I, this is another thing, again, it's short. I did read it, but I read it not in one consecutive movement. <laughs> I read it in pieces and uh, chapters uh, scattered around, uh, and I, it was wonderful. So I think um, even if no one has read, if you haven't read Moby Dick or you feel like you should read, read Moby Dick, um, feels like a gap in your uh, background, um, try this instead. And maybe it'll motivate you, maybe it won't, but it's a really good book in and of itself. So why read Moby Dick? All right. Are you going to be reading Moby Dick? Now that no. You, that? <laughs> you know, yeah, there's too many other books that go by my desk in the back room for me. <laughs> Moby Dick is a, is a, you should read it though. Yes, that, I figured you'd have something it's really to say good. about it. So. Um, well, my book is also just like the book you just did. It's a short little book. You won't be able to see it probably. And it's about a famous author and his works. Not one book, but in a way it's kind of one book. This is called, this is by Michael Durda. It's called On Conan Doyle. Um, and the it, author it, of Sherlock yes, Holmes. The subtitle, this is Or the Whole Art of Storytelling. This book could be subtitled Why You Should Read Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> <laughs> this book is sort of an um. An homage, is that the right word? Um, homage. homage. Homage to Conan Doyle, not just the Sherlock Holmes stories, but his whole canon of works. You know, Arthur Conan Doyle, I should say, unfortunately, he's known for um, just Sherlock Holmes, but he wrote massive, he wrote hundreds of books on all different genres and very well received. I mean, he, Michael Durr has read many of his other works. He says, you know, you, people really should read some of his other stuff, the really great adventure stories, you know, The Lost World, all those. He wrote a lot of short stories. In fact, you probably know this, halfway through the Sherlock Holmes, he actually killed him off in a famous episode. Sherlock Holmes died. And then um, 
there was such outrage in London, and all throughout, I shouldn't say in London and England and America, where his stories are very popular. He, Count and Daughter didn't want to, he didn't really, he didn't write stories for like five, I think five or six years. So finally he relented and put out Hounds of Bask, the Hounds oh, of Baskervilles. Oh, really? Well, oh. that was a pre, that was like a prequel to all the other ones. But eventually, the public demand was too much, and he had to he had to bring him back. So he devised that he didn't really die and all he that. He disappeared. He yeah, was in a, some uh, cocaine great, den, or opium den. No, no, no. <laughs> there's there's a lot of theories about what how that happened. But this book is also about the Baker Street Irregulars. Zena, do you know who the no, Baker Street Irregulars are? No, but I've are? heard of it, but no, I know. <laughs> I'm going to say it's some kind of a, um, a detective uh, agency. Well, in the stories, in the Sherlock Holmes stories, the Baker Street Irregulars were sort of street, I think, oh, street, street kids, kids, urchins that oh, helped Sherlock Holmes. informants, informants. Informants that helped Sherlock ah. Holmes with this. But there's a group in America called the Baker Street Irregulars who study the works you know, the sacred writings, they call it. They play the grand, they call it the grand game. And that is, these people get together and they have meetings and they actually act, they talk about, and they're, all their work, in a lot of writings, they have a journal, they have a website. It, they, um, it's, they act like the stories are true. The Sherlock Holmes is a real person, they call it the grand game. So you have to, it's, you have to pretend, although oh, if no. you talk to them, they don't pretend. They say, he really existed. <laughs> So Michael Dirt is a member, and he talks about how he got in, in, um, inducted into them and how, what it's like being part of that group. It's really interesting. It sounds like uh, Star Trekkies. Trekkies. Yes, they're like that. So, and Michael Dirt has written many books about um, books about books. He was he he was the um, he was the editor of the Washington Post Book World. It was the Sunday section, book review section, which alas is no more, no more the the, the newspaper world. It's kind of sad. His books about his reading, I think he has a book called Readings. His books about his, from his book reviews and his readings and why he likes to read, and, and he reads all kinds of stuff. They're really good. And he, he um, goes from, he's the kind of guy you would like because, if you like to read a lot, and you like a lot of different things. Because he even said somewhere, sometimes you feel like reading Sartre, and sometimes you feel like reading Mickey Spillane. <laughs> so even though he reads a lot of literary stuff and has written all kinds of reviews, he really loves detective, science fiction, mysteries, and a lot, a lot of genre stuff. So this is his book about Conan Doyle, on Conan Doyle. His other books, I think, um, well, yeah, one is called Readings, Bound to Please, um, book by book. So if you're interested in books and the pleasures of reading, you can't go wrong with Michael Durda and his book about Conan Doyle and Sherlock Holmes. It's called On Conan Doyle. Zena? Yeah. Yes. Um, okay, this attracted my attention by the cover, too. Um, some of you will know of Hedy Lamar. I had known that she was an actress, a beautiful woman, you know, before my time. Um, but that's all I knew about Hedy Lamar. But the, the, um, cover is actually a picture of her at her uh, in her top form uh, actually riding some kind of a missile um, and even the print here is in gold uh, the missile is actually in gold and the print is in gold so it's called Hetty's Folly the life and breakthrough inventions of Hetty Lamar the most beautiful woman in the world by Richard Rhodes he, the author, is a Pulitzer Prize winning author of The Making of the Atomic Bomb. So the author is actually a special specialist um, in uh, military matters, uh, military weapons. And um, so the whole thing attracted my attention and uh, it, I learned something I hadn't no idea of. She, uh, Hedy Lamar, I guess it's a stage name, her, um, I can't remember her real last name, but she was an Austrian Jew uh, and um, by the time she was 20, she was in Austria, and she had become a famous um, 
shall I, I'll say a star uh, for acting in some rather erotic movies. And she also had married a um, munis munitions uh, businessman who had eventually had dealings with some of the Nazis. So Hedy Lamar eventually divorced or left her husband and came to the U.S. and she became a star uh, in Hollywood and acted in many films that some of you may be familiar with. I don't think I've ever seen a film of hers. But apparently she had a father who paid a lot of attention to her uh, and he, made, he helped her uh, encourage her curiosity and I guess she did have some training as a engineer when she was in Austria. But her, her hobby was inventing things, inventions. Um, and uh, in the uh, late 30s, early 40s, she met another gentleman in the arts. In, uh, and his, I can't remember, his name was George Antheil, A-N-T-H-E-I-L. Uh, probably not pronouncing correctly, and he was a composer. And between the two of them, they came up with this um, uh, invention. They're calling it an invention. Um, it's, it has something to do with uh, broad spectrum uh, technology, communications technology. Uh, they were looking for, Hedy Lamar was interested in helping uh, submarines navigate, uh, su submarines um, uh, shoot their torpedoes in a more accurate way. And and uh, she actually devised something that would have helped that. But the U.S. Navy, when they tried to sell it to them, Hedy Lamar and her partner George, um, uh, tried to sell it to the Navy, they turned it down. Um, but um, eventually, the United States government did buy the patent from Hedy Lamar and her partner, uh, but they didn't use it um, until uh, much later when some of our new communications technology was developed, GPS, uh, cell phones, and uh, it was the basis of uh, that new technology. Um, it talks about how her life and um, how she got to the U.S., how she paid attention to her husband's, then husband's, uh, business dealings when she was in business meetings and learned enough about weaponry to um, uh, uh, enlarge her uh, field of knowledge enough to actually uh, uh, create this invention. She, it seems like out of this world to me, um, literally, that someone who uh, made their living by uh, beauty and sex appeal uh, also had this other side. And they said in her home in Hollywood, she uh, actually had a couple of rooms devoted just to creating different things. Um, mm -hmm. And you know, most of us women would be scrapbooking or knitting <laughs> or something. And apparently, she was very handy um, uh, with uh, mechanics mechanical things and uh, so I guess um, she did uh, get some recognition before she actually died at the end of her life. She lived a pretty long life. Um, she really didn't get any monetary advantage out of it. And um, uh, but it's a fascinating story. I mean, it's just yeah, that so book got a lot, unusual. Of press. a lot of press. So unusual. So unusual. Hetty's folly, and the folly <laughs> is about trusting that the U.S. government would be smart enough to see the usefulness of their <laughs> invention and use it during uh, the war. So I highly recommend it by Richard Rhodes. Okay. Rhodes. Now here's a book that combines a famous American artist, painter, and a, and a poet. The book, you can probably, hopefully you'll see this, the book is called Hopper, and the author is Mark Strand, Pulitzer Prize winning poet. I think he was poet laureate, too. The book is very short. Well, I shouldn't say very short. Well, it is kind of short. He, what he does, he takes um, about, about 40 or so Edward Hopper paintings. I'm sure you know a lot of them. Um, Nighthawks. The famous one, maybe you can see that Nighthawks, the guy sitting at the diner. Um, down, they're kind of bleak. Yeah, they're, they're kind stark, of bleak, stark, dark. Stark. Second story, sunlight. Oh, early Sunday morning. That's kind of a famous painting. And Mark Strand, he does these one, they're very short, one or two little page, half essay, half meditation on the painting. And he's, I think he writes what you think. He's not writing, these writings aren't, from an art critic's perspective. They're more like what you would expect a poet to write. So he, he kind of imagines what might, what might be going on. And, but he does talk a little bit about the, the lines and the painting and the colors. But it's, it's mainly, like I say, little meditations on 
on these Edward Hopper paintings, and I read a few. They're very interesting. And again, everyone knows Edward Hopper's paintings and his style. So if you want a poet's take on a famous American painter, Mark Strand, former poet laureate, winner of the Pulitzer Prize, the book is just simply called Hopper. It was good. I, I mean, I read a few. It was good. I could see how that would be. I always like to have people help me interpret what I'm seeing in a, paint, in a work of art because I'm not <laughs> particularly perceptive or schooled <laughs> in that field. Um, this is called Lights of Mankind, the Earth at Night as Seen from Space. And it's uh, for a book of 400 photos uh, taken from the International Space Station. Um, and I guess they called through thousands, if not millions, of photos to uh, pick out these 400. Um, and the, ver the, f the picture on the front is, that is the actually Nile River? the Nile River. Nile right. I don't know that you can see at home. But um, it's, it's fascinating. And it, and, uh, it's, uh, it also includes um, commentary by some American astronauts to describe what it's like to see the Earth from, um, from the, uh, space and to see the Earth at night. This is a, apparently the first book uh, of photos taken of the Earth at night, and it covers the pictures are from all around the world, and it um, uh, excuse the pun illuminates the <laughs> uh, I don't usually do that illuminates the uh, history and geography of how we have. Um, uh, constructed the planet, where we've chosen to live, why, and it tells you why we've chosen to live, and where there are lights, like um, there's one very telling uh, spread in here of North Korea and oh. South Korea, and I think, I think what, in, I actually looked for this book because it was talked about on one of the national news mm -hmm. um, shows about um, North, there's a South Korea, North Korea uh, picture at, taken at night and South Korea is all lit up and North Korea is almost totally black. Um, well, they turn the power off at night up there. I, think. I don't even know if they have power, well, yeah. much power. <laughs> Here's my question for you, Joe. What, what's the single brightest spot on earth? The single brightest spot, spot on Earth at night. I, well, it seems like the obvious choice would would be to say New York City, but close. It's in the United States. Um, let me say <laughs> Miami, Las Vegas. Oh, La oh wait, Las right. Vegas. Makes... Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, there is New York City uh, is in here, and it's very bright. Why is uh, I have a question? This is New York City, uh, Long Island, New York City. It's very, very bright. If you can see, I'm not sure. But, why is the Nile all lit up? It looks like there's street lights all the way up the Nile. I know. It's fascinating. That must be where right. the cities have uh, grown up. Okay. Yeah, it doesn't even seem like there's any gaps at all. Isn't uh -huh. it fascinating? So you can see, uh, like in the Midwest, uh, all along the rivers in our Midwest U.S., um, it's, it really is fascinating. It has seven wonders of the nighttime world, and it, it picks out seven photographs that they consider the best. And okay. it's really, uh, you learn a lot about the world. So, okay. Right. We've well, got time for a few more here. Now, Zena, I have another question for you. When I say to you, John Updike, the late John Updike, he died in 2009. John Updike, um, what, do you, what do you think of him? Rabbit. Okay. But oh, anything else? No. Okay. Well, <laughs> but I understand what you're saying. John Updike, of course, is mainly known for his novels and fiction, novels and short stories, which he wrote. I can't even count them all on the inside flap. He, I think at least over 40 works of fiction, counting, wow. fi counting short stories. And, you know, he's one of my all-time favorites. I love him. However, in case you did not know this, I'm sure he, I was, uh, <laughs> he wrote mountains of book reviews and essays. He did a lot of art criticism. In fact, he has a couple of whole books of art criticism. His essays and criticisms are collected in five books. Each one is like... Eight eight hundred pages. I mean, if so he, did, he he really oh, wrote. Every I don't know how day, he had time. Day. I don't know how he had time to write his own books. But I'll just say, if he was only known for his his say ten books of criticism, counting literary, counting essays, and counting art criticism, 
he would have been remembered as one of the greatest critics ever. But you add to this his 40 or 50 works of fiction. I don't know how he had time for anything. So this is the last collection. Um, he did die in 2009, but this is his last collection of his essays and criticism since his last, since his last I'm one. I'm looking at the title, Higher Gossip. That sounds fascinating. Okay, the, book is called, the book is called Higher Gossip, Essays and Criticism, John Updike. Higher Gossip means, I think, now I gotta see where I, where I found it in here. John Updike used that term from, I'll, I'll read this because it's kind of interesting. Um, let's see. In, in one of his other books of criticism, he says that um, a review, a book, a review well done is gossip of a higher sort. So that's why I think it's called Higher Gossip. So this is his last collection. It's a wonderful picture of John Updike on the cover, tipping his hat. Oh, John Updike also wrote um, about 10 books of poetry. I mean, he was, he was amazing. Did he live a long life if he just He was died? in his late 70s. Okay, so, you know, that's good. Um, so this is his last collection, posthumously. Is that the correct right word? That's, Higher yeah. Gossip. It's all his book reviews, his introductions to books, his essays on all kinds of topics. There's a lot of art in here. He wrote about golf, some of his poems, some of, some of his um, speeches he made. He, he, was, he was all over the place. And he writes about, he wrote some here on pets. He, he literally wrote about everything you could think of. So his nonfiction books are really wonderful. He was a great stylist, if you like good writing. You can, and you cannot go wrong by reading John Updike. So this is Higher Gossip. Do you I'm, have one I'm more? I'm going to just talk quickly about this book. I won't say very much about it, except that people might want to try it for something very unusual. This is called Mrs. Nixon, a novelist, imagine, a novelist Imagines a Life by Anne Beattie. Is that right? Yes. That right? Now, she's uh, famous for her short stories. And this actually is kind of like short stories. Uh, each chapter is different. Um, some of it is fiction, as she imagines uh, Pat Nixon Nixon's to, uh, life to be like. She says that writers uh, like people like Pat Nixon who never had much of a um, public um, uh, life in the sense that they displayed themselves or gave their opinions or people didn't know very much about Pat Nixon and her life except a few facts, which she does include in here, but she very definitely says it's a novelist imagines a life. So you could, uh, some chapters are, as I said, are pieces of fiction, short stories about parts, uh, episodes in uh, Pat Nixon's life. Um, some chapters uh, discuss about uh, writing by biography or writing fictionalized biography uh, the it often ta it talks about how you uh, a writer approaches different kinds of of writing it's a real mix of uh, let's see they talk about it the review talks is, uh, talks about it as a mix of biography fiction and literary criticism now it got uh, mixed reviews I'll say um, some uh, review sources that we use didn't like it they said it was uh, scattered and uh, a little bit chaotic and uh, at least one source gave it a starred review book list which we um, uh, use all the time uh, when we're choosing our books. Um, so it's a well-known uh, uh, review source for us. Um, it's not like anything I've ever read before. And uh, so you can, you can uh, learn a little bit about uh, writing and about how, how writers approach their craft and you can learn about the different kinds of writing but you can also learn a little bit about Mrs. Nixon and Richard as well. So I would say some, if someone wants to try something new this is it. Mrs. Nixon, a novelist imagines a life. Alright, I will do one more since we have time for one All right. more. And it goes along with your book. Okay. This is also a book, a fictionalized account of a famous person, a writer. You know, this, is, this seems to be a, a new genre, I guess you could say. No, I shouldn't say new, but in the last several years, what, the, the Paris Wife, was that last yeah. year, about Ernest yeah. Hemingway? Uh, yeah, I think. In the last five years, there were two, fixed, two novels where Henry James was the main character, one of them by this guy, David Lodge. This is his new book, A Man of Parts. It's a fictionalized, um, not, it's, a, what fictionalized it's a novel about H.G. Wells, A Man of Parts. You can't really see on here. The cover's got these little, I don't know what to say, I don't know if people use this term anymore, little French postcards, if you know what the term means. <laughs> Erotic poses. So the um, <laughs> Man of Parts, this is like a fictional reimagination of H.G. Wells' life told from his, in the, in, he died in 1945 or 6, 
he's sort of alone in his room and he's sort of reimagining his whole life. And you know, David Lodge is a very famous novelist and literary critic. So he goes in, you know, he's very well read in, in H.D. Wells, so the book covers Wells's life through, you know, through Wells's writing, only he's, he's imagining um, H.D. Wells himself, and I think there's, you know, there's characters, people come in and out of the room, talk to him. So again, like that book that you just talked about, yes, it got some mixed reviews, but you know, David Lodge, very inventive writer, I read a couple of his novels, I, I do really like him, and his, his literary criticism, his books about books are really good too. So. And I was just looking at this because I'm in the middle of reading a new biography of H.G. Wells, which I didn't have time for, but fascinating guy, turn of the century. He lived from the um, Victorian into the, he lived up 1866 to 1946. And, you know, he, he's famous for science fiction and all that, but he wrote all kinds of social commentary. He was part of the Fabians. He was, he, he thought Russia, he thought Russia under the Bolsheviks was kind of a utopia. He was all over the place. But a, a man of contradictions, and he had all these affairs, and he but had a very full life. Full life, but this is a reimagining of it by David Lodge, a wonderful writer. I'm going to read this only because I'm reading the biography, and it's very interesting. So, A Man of Parts by David Lodge. Do you want to talk and then about this, Zena? Finally, I, Joe's probably going to have to help me just to talk about this uh, book called Justice: What's the Right Thing to Do by uh, Harvard professor of philosophy Michael Sandel. We uh, uh, last week kicked off uh, a series um, that we're having um, once a month. Uh, Sunday on afternoons. Sunday afternoons. Uh, we're having a showing of, uh, uh, we have a DVD of uh, some of Sandel's uh, lectures. They're more than lectures. He interacts with students um, in a huge auditorium at Harvard uh, teaching this class on justice. And um, we're having, showing, uh, I think it's at least four or five Sundays um, in the next few months. Uh, parts of his class, his course on justice, and we're having a discussion. Here in the library. Here in the library, a uh, discussion led by uh, a, lot, a different librarian each time. So last week we had the kickoff, and Sunday's uh, first Sunday was uh, yesterday. It was a Sunday, January 21st or 2nd. Um, and it was well attended, and we just want to make sure people know. Yes, I think that we had about 40 people came to the first one. So January is obviously over, but if you'll be watching this, there are going to be Sundays, February, March, April, and May, so there's four left. So, so go have, to the library's webpage for we the dates. We have copies of this book. And, and anyone, anyone can come, and we're going to watch it and talk about those issues, have a discussion. Well, that is it for So Many Books, So Little Time, show 24, and we'll see you next time.